I'm going to talk a little bit about what the District Health Board does. Um, I'm going to talk about our relationship with the Canterbury Water Management Strategy, a little bit about the drinking water targets, but I'm mostly going to talk about the effect on health. We've heard a little bit about that. Um, it's not all about health, um, but obviously as a, as a doctor, um, the issues that, that I face both as a GP and as a public health physician are, are important to me and to my patients and to most of the community, I think. The District Health Board um, has a position statement um, supporting the Canterbury Water Management Strategy. The Canterbury Water Management Strategy is one of the best tools we've got and <coughs> at this point in time, and they have uh, Though they deal with health, um, they've supported the water management strategy in all its forms. Um, I'm just going to go back. I just want to point out that the, the reason for that, uh, one of the things I should have said at the beginning, is that the all district health boards under the Health and Disability Act have, a, have an obligation uh, to promote not just the, the social but also the environmental effects um, of, uh, on the health of people and communities. So our board is not just a hospital board anymore, like it used to be. It has to think about all those kinds of things that will affect the health of our community, which include, includes the quality of our water. They support the drinking water targets in the water management strategy because if, if we don't meet those targets, we will see people die. Uh, we do still see people die from drinking water. You'll occasionally hear people say people don't die from drinking water. That's not true. Um, but people not meeting the requirements will be fine, uh, providing, particularly those providing drinking water. But as a community, if we don't meet those targets, and they're ambitious targets, it, it is ultimately going to cost us a lot more anyway, particularly in terms of treatment. It's very, very expensive, for example, to remove nitrate from water once it gets in there. It is actually quite in, expensive to chlorinate water, but we all know from the earthquake that chlorinating our water although it, it can make our water safe from E. coli, it's not something we would choose to do if we could avoid it. Uh, at this point in time, we're lucky enough in Canterbury, at least in, in Christchurch, to be able to drink water that isn't chlorinated. We're one of the largest cities in the world that is able to do that. Other examples that are cities like Avian in South, in this, uh, near, near the Swiss border in France, which of course sell, they sell their water, they're quite famous for that. We could probably sell ours as drinking water if we wanted to at this point in time, at least from some parts of the city. The other thing is that we, we need to think about the whole process from our source right up to our tap of producing water, because the infection pathway follows that process. Um, we have people that present sometimes come and see me as a general practitioner who are sick um, and they have become sick through a disease reservoir somewhere out in the community. Sometimes it's through the, the, the raw water, sometimes contamination of the source water. It's not always. Sometimes it could be the treatment process. Um, and, and at other times it might be something to do with the reticulation system. So our, our laws are set up to protect us at every stage of the process. The Imperfect Resource Management Act um, is designed to protect our raw water. We have uh, aspects of the Health Act, which um, are, are the drinking water parts of the, the Health Act, which are designed to, in terms of drinking water standards, to protect the way we treat our water and monitor our water. And finally, we have the Building Act, a lot of which looks at how the reticulated system works. 
So the legislation follows the, the risk pathways in terms of infection. I'm going to talk about a little bit about some of the key issues that we might face. We've seen a lot of pictures of toxic blooms, um, cyanobacteria. I'm also going to talk about nitrates, what nitrates means as well as the consequences of increased nitrates, and also about microbiological contaminants, which uh, are probably one of the most important things to think about. Um, essentially, um, the, we've heard a little bit about why cyanobacteria uh, has, has increased. Uh, it's partly about nutrients. It is also partly about temperature increases and river flows. Also, we've seen how we can prevent contamination of the water body by diverting water. But diverting water can also contaminate sometimes. It can, it can draw algae into a place where we want to avoid it. There are plenty of communities that live alongside our rivers in, in Canterbury who uh, get some of their drinking water from the rivers themselves. So although we've heard about how <coughs> horses and dogs can be poisoned by algal blooms, and certainly uh, it can cause rashes and other minor symptoms in humans, if they drink the water, they can get very sick as well. And there are cases where people are using infiltration galleries that potentially could get infected by algae bloom. <coughs> You've heard a little bit about blue baby syndrome. Um, fetuses have a special type of haemoglobin which binds oxygen very, very tightly. Um, for good reason. That means they get more oxygen than their mother does. So as their mother breathes, um, the baby's haemoglobin will pull the oxygen out of the mother's circulation. But the problem for a newborn is that they still have some of that fetal haemoglobin floating around. And what that means is when nitrites get converted to nitrates in their gut, um, the nitrate binds to their haemoglobin very, very tightly. So it's analogous to being poisoned by carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide binds to haemoglobin and it's not released. Nitrate is very similar, which is why newborn babies are particularly vulnerable. Once they're more than a few months old, they have ordinary hemoglobin which doesn't bind as tightly, and they're much more likely to survive if they drink um, nitrate-contaminated water. The thing is, uh, if a breastfed baby will not get sick because they're not drinking the water. Bottle-fed babies are the babies at risk. So we do quite a lot of work um, with our local midwives. Uh, they like to encourage breastfeeding because it's healthier for babies, but from a public health point of view, it also reduces the risk um, of being poisoned by nitrate if you happen to be in an environment where your nitrate levels are high. And of course the irony is a lot of the, the, the poorer families that are working in rural areas uh, probably have moved to those areas to get jobs in the dairy industry. But the, the young mums in those areas are actually the ones, um, first of all, often um, may not understand the importance of breastfeeding or for, for whatever reason may be bottle feeding their babies. Um, and their babies are the ones that are most at risk. Um, people often ask me how many babies have died from blue baby syndrome in New Zealand. The answer is very, very few because for many decades, uh, uh, maximum acceptable value for nitrate has been set at a level that protects our newborns. Um, there may be cases we don't know about because um, uh, methemoglobinemia or blue baby syndrome is not notifiable and in the past there could have been cases of sudden infant de death syndrome that were inappropriately diagnosed. So what, what's happening with our nitrate? Um, I talked a little bit about the families that are at risk. This is a 2011 map, and um, I've, I put it up really to contrast what is going on in our region. The yellow areas are moderate risk, and those are the areas we would encourage uh, pregnant mums to get their water tested if they're on a, on a small community or private bore. And there are high risk areas where they absolutely should not be um, using the water to make um, a mix up uh, formula for their babies. And there are other areas that are low risk, and where they could do that. 
But let's see what's happened. Over the last few years, um, there's a lot less of the low-risk areas. They've disappeared and become moderate. And we've also found some of the high-risk areas are expanding, and we've got one or two new ones as well. So we're not doing particularly well in reducing nitrates. We, we, we support the Canterbury Water Management Strategy, but we've yet to see any improvement. This is the 2015 picture. It's not as good as it was in 2011. And if we look at uh, one example from our area, this just shows a variety of wells where nitrates have been tested for over the last few years. And we can see from 91 through to the beginning of the millennium, it was reasonably flat, and nitrates in our drinking water are just climbing and climbing and climbing. There is no evidence that we're seeing any improvement just yet. The Canterbury Water Management Strategy has a target um, of reducing nitrate levels in all groundwater levels to below 50% of the MAV by 2040. They have other targets also, which they have to meet. One of those is they have to increase irrigation of land. They have a target of increased irrigation for its own sake. That's a difficult thing to juggle with uh, some of the other targets. But just um, talk a bit about ma microbiological contaminants as well and then give you some examples. We have 17,000 notified cases of gastroenteritis a year. Um, the notified cases are just a small proportion of what we see. We have, it's estimated, that up to 35,000 waterborne illnesses presenting every year, and those are just the ones that present. Remember, a lot of people get sick and they don't turn up to their, to their doctors. Here in the, in the South Canterbury, we have one of the highest rates of campylobacteriosis in the world, and we have increasing rates of E. coli 0157, which is a toxic E. coli, which is the commonest cause of renal failure in children. And I, there's a picture here, just at the bottom, that shows a child on renal dialysis. If they're poisoned by toxic E. coli, they can sometimes require dialysis for the rest of their lives, at least until they require a, a renal transplant. So it's not something you want to get poisoned by. If we look at Campy, across parts of our region, we can see that increasingly, we, we, sadly, we are ahead of the New Zealand average. And the, the New Zealand average is brought down by the urban population. If you live in a rural area, you're much more likely to get these waterborne illnesses. A lot of people will have heard about the Walkerton tragedy from Canada. Um, it, it was a very similar environment to the way we work. It was a dairy farming town, not a very large town, um, where in which about half the community got infected with E. coli. There were seven deaths, um, boil, water, boil water notices for six months, and it cost them $64 million in direct costs. The indirect costs were much higher. It was our opportunity to learn from their sad mistake. But it, the report is well worth reading. Um, and I'll just quote here from this one, because we mustn't forget the real personal cost of some of these tragedies. Most of the seven were children, but there was um, a mother amongst them, Betty Trushinsky. It says in the report that she died in the hospital, away from her home, hooked up to machines and tubes in a coma. She suffered terribly for ten days. She never had a chance to understand her illness. She couldn't put her affairs in order or say goodbye because there was no time. She just got sicker and sicker, and we were always ten steps behind the illness. The dreams of her retirement with Dad, this was a quote from, from her daughter, and travelling were stolen, all because the water was unsafe and nobody told her. What happened in Walkerton was one of those situations where a whole load of unfortunate events coincided. It was, the, it was the intensification of their farming combined with poor management strategies and a source problem. We've had some similar ones. Um, in 2012 in Darfield, we had a Campylobacter outbreak. Again, it was a combination of things. It was an infiltration gallery combined with flooding at the same time with the failure of a chlorine analyzer. 
um, in the in the organisation responsible for delivering the water. So again, you can see these. You have to protect all your barriers if you're going to be have a safe situation. In Dunstanville, nobody got sick, fortunately, at least nobody we knew about. But there were E. coli transgressions there, some of which could have been toxic. It was definitely sourced to local animals, farm animals. And that was in a relatively deep well. So people that tell you if you if you go down more deeply, you're safe, it's not necessarily the case. In the Springston outbreak, we, again, we had, similar to Walkerton, nearly 50% of the township were affected. They were a rural township with GP, and it was very hard for them to get into their GP. So we didn't hear about these 50% until we started actively surveying them. There was at least one case amongst those of toxic E. coli. Fortunately, she survived, she didn't get very sick. But you can see how this could easily have been a Walkerton tragedy. Again, a combination of factors, a cracked bore um, in a town surrounded by intensive farming. So the Public Health Unit submits on applications for various uh, attempts to intensify and one of the latest ones we're working on is the Balf Balmoral Forest um, application by Naitahu, which aims to, to have one of the biggest dairy farms in the country. We are concerned about toxic algal blooms downstream from that, um, waterborne pathogens in the water, which actually, ironically, will affect um, a da downstream camping ground, which is very heavily used um, by, by local Maori um, uh, for their holidays. Um, so we are working with Naitahu at the moment trying to negotiate a, a, settle, a, a settlement after that that's going to be more favourable for our community. So we're aiming to have better control over pathogens and nutrients. They're both important from a health perspective. I'll, uh, I've just been told time's up. So I will leave it there for the time being.